Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. We got an email from a listener named Brandy, and she had a fantastic idea, in addition to telling us how much she loves the podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she had a great idea that we're going to start doing. She did. She had the great idea. She asked us if we would start listing the names of all the movies we discuss in each episode in our show notes. So that way, she doesn't have to go back and rewind and find the reference, but it's okay to rewind and re-listen. That's fine. Yes, we love that. But, but great idea. It is a great idea. So we will start doing that. I'm going to start this episode off in a very controversial way. Do do it. So we're going to be talking about character actresses or, or. <laughs> character actors who are female. Pick which one you like. Because of the time period that we're talking about, my mind goes immediately to actress because yes. that's what female actors during that time period were referred to as. Exactly. We know that in 2024, the term actress can have a diminishing quality. We certainly want want all actors to be paid what they are worth. But because we're talking about the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, we are going to use actress. We're going to use actress, folks. Brace yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. This is a topic both you and I Oh, we love, we love this topic. We do. And we've talked about a few character actors and actresses in previous episodes, but now we get to focus on just the ladies. Yes, and some of our favorites. Of course, stars are stars and they make a movie, but it's the character actors to me that just put the finishing touch on a perfect movie. Exactly. It's like that frosting and the cherry. <laughs> they provide that for, for my mind. And the first one we're going to talk about is the mother of all mothers, Beulah Bondi. Uh, now, the first thing that comes to mind with Ms. Bondi is It's a Wonderful Life. Of course. I think that's what everybody thinks of her most from is It's a Wonderful Life, Ma Bailey. And Ma Bailey. And even as a young person watching that movie for the first time and the second time and the third time, I'm always struck by the way she is able to play the same character with two different sets of circumstances yes. and how different she is. Yes, absolutely. And it's just a testament to who she was yeah, as an actor. She was a phenomenal actress and you, you can see it in that one film as you you mentioned you know she's the warm kind understanding ma bailey had george lived mm -hmm. but had george never been born she was cold and aloof and this harsh woman so you know it's a, an attribute to her acting ability it really is and i think in a lot of ways her whole career can be defined by the ma bailey character because when she played sweet there was nobody sweeter she was the best mother she was so lovely and kind and I think of her in movies like Remember the Night, where she plays Fred McMurray's mother, oh. who actually helps reform yes. the petty thief, Barbara Stanwyck. Yes, right. <laughs> because right. of her goodness and her kindness. And she's so great in Our Town as William Holden's mother, Mrs. Gibbs. Again, just this lovely, quintessential motherly love that just oozes from the screen. Yeah. And I also think of another one that comes to mind is it's not a mother role, but it's as the adoption agency pro who provides a child for Cary Grant and Irene Dunn in Penny Serenade. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, if you're not crying after those scenes, yeah, <laughs> yeah there's yeah. no hope. You know, when we when I was looking into her long career, I was struck by the fact that she was on an episode of The Waltons. Yes, a couple of episodes. And, and she won an Emmy. She did, which um, just talks about the longevity and the depth of her career. And that Ellen Corby, who she was in It's a Wonderful Life with, <laughs> is also... Plays in, yeah, mob, in uh, yes, also as the little lady. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing I love about Beulah Bondi is, you know, we talked about her good side. She could also play pretty evil characters. And, yes. And, you know, not that frequently, but in Finishing School, which is a wonderful 1934 movie, she plays this manipulative head of an exclusive girls boarding school, and she makes life miserable for Ginger Rogers and Frances D. She's just horrible. You can't even imagine it's the same woman. And then she's also in a movie called Bad Boy from 1935, and she's James Dunn 
Anne's horrible, disapproving mother. So, you know, there, there was a little dark side to Beulah there, sometimes, there too. There definitely was. And I think that really is a testament to what a wonderful actress she was. Because yeah. that's not an easy thing to do. Usually, you get cast as one thing or another. And as we'll talk about with other character yes. actresses, they do get typecast. They and do get typecast. Beulah did a lot. Beulah was at both ends of the spectrum. She really did. She was nominated twice for an Oscar uh, for Best Supporting Actress. The first time was in the movie The Gorgeous Hussy from 1936. And she played our first lady, Rachel Jackson, in a pretty stunning performance. It's a powerful but small part, but you don't forget her Mm -hmm. once you watch that movie. And her second Oscar nomination was for the wonderful movie that I adore called Of Human Hearts Uh from 1938, where she played Jimmy Stewart's kindly mother. In fact, Beulah Bondi was often called Jimmy Stewart's mother in Hollywood because she played his mother so So many many darn times. times. Yeah. (laughs) And and so beautifully. Yeah. Well, Beulah Bondi, we miss you. And you know, I just want to say one last thing about Beulah Bondi before we move on is if you only watch one Beulah Bondi movie besides It's a Wonderful Life, go check out Make Way for Tomorrow, 1937. It's one of the rare times where she plays the lead. And it's this incredibly beautiful and sentimental drama where she and Victor Moore play this elderly couple who ended up being separated in their older years because of greedy children and circumstances. And it is heartbreaking and it is one of her best performances of her career. Make way for tomorrow. We will put that in the yes. show notes. Our next actress is someone who I just recently saw in something, Elizabeth Patterson. Yes. We love Elizabeth Patterson. Born in 1874. She passed away in 1966. Also had a long career and is a Tennessee gal. She is a Tennessee gal. I love that. She was born in Savannah, Tennessee. I think most people know her for playing the kindly Mrs. Trumbull. Yeah. The neighbor (laughs) on I Love Lucy who who started out as this really crabby lady who was all against little Ricky. Right. Because it was an adults only building. But then she met him and she fell in love with him and she becomes his babysitter. Yes. I think that's the thing that most people know her from. But she just had these soulful, earnest eyes and she had this little scrawny body and she kind of would shuffle around in a very comic way. She excelled, I think, in comedies and dramas equally. I I do too. She wasn't in, according to my research, a film until she was 52. Yes, it's very true Uh, because she got her start in college and theater and then she went to Chicago. She got very active in the Chicago theater scene and she made her Broadway debut in 1913 in a play called Every Man. And she mainly stayed in Broadway during her 20s, 30s, and 40s. Right. And then she finally made her screen debut in her 50s called The Boyfriend in 1926. Wow. She is also in Remember the Night. Yes, as the aunt of yes, Fred McMurray. Right. She was so great at, like Beulah Bondi, playing these kind, loving mothers. She's in so many great movies. She's in Tarnished Lady, 1931, with Tallulah. Bankhead. Also, Bill of Divorcement 1932 as Catherine Hepburn's aunt. No Man of Her Own with Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. I mean, she's just in so many great movies of the era. And working with so many huge stars. So many great stars. But I think some of my personal favorite performances of hers, she is unforgettable in Tobacco Road, Mm. where she plays Charlie Grapewin's troubled wife in that whole Depression era of drama. She's incredible. And she's also really good And she played this role twice, which I find very interesting. She's in the 1939 film, The Cat and the Canary, Mm. with Bob Hope and Paulette Goddard. But she'd played the role of Aunt Susan in the 1930 version called The Cat Creeps, which I found very interesting. (laughs) And it's based on a play by John Willard. So, you know, I love that she can play it in 1930. She can play it in 1939. Right, right. A couple of other movies that listeners may want to check out of hers. If you haven't seen Sing You Sinners, uh, she plays Bing Crosby, Fred McMurray, and Donald O'Connor's mother. She's great in that. (laughs) Also, I Married a Witch, which we have talked about in our Halloween episode. She's the housekeeper of Frederick March. And she's also wonderful as Ella Raines' aunt in Hail the Conquering Hero in 1944 and in the Elizabeth Taylor, June Allison, Margaret O'Brien version of Little Women in 1949. So those are 
great movies from her if you want to get a, a chance to check her out. Our next actress that we're going to be talking about is Virginia Christine. My now, favorite. Yes. Now. I love she, her so much. <laughs> she, uh, we, we grew up with her, right, we, on we television. We did. Well, I think much like Elizabeth Patterson, most people know her from television, not from a TV series, not from a special, but from a TV commercial. Right. As Mrs. Olsen in she the 1970s. was. Everyone knows the Swedish neighbor who saved many marriages by teaching those brides how to make a good cup of coffee because, from Folgers. Yes. <laughs> you need to have, it's mountain grown, it's right? It's mountain grown, <laughs> which was perfect because she was actually from Swedish descent. I think the accent was very authentic and she brought that lovely matronly appeal to that character. And it really caught on and she ended up doing those commercials for 10 years. You, I'm sure made a fortune. <laughs> I hope she did. But before that, she had quite a career in film. She did. She was born in Stanton, Iowa, which I've actually visited. Oh. I One time I shot a movie in another part of Iowa. And on my day off, I drove to this little tiny town of Stanton, Iowa, in the middle of cornfields. And the beauty is, in the town, they have two water towers. And they've painted them to look like a cup of coffee and a percolator <laughs> in honor of their hometown girl, Virginia I Christine. I love that. <laughs> that is so sweet. Yeah. So it's kind of fun. She was raised there in Iowa, but her family moved to Los Angeles. And when she got there, she started training with a great actor named Fritz Feld, whom she ended up marrying, and they had one of the longest and probably happiest marriages in Hollywood, which I love. But she started out as a leading lady. I mean, she she was blonde, she was blue-eyed, she was beautiful, and she slowly made the transition over to character actress, Yes, which I find interesting. I do too, and probably fairly rare that that happens. You know, some of her first films, actually her very first film was a movie called Edge of Darkness in 1943, which starred Errol Flynn and Anne Sheridan, and in it, she played a Norwegian peasant girl. So once again, typecast as mm-hmm. the Scandinavian beauty. Mm-hmm. Those good Midwestern roots. <laughs> exactly. But one of her early movies, now it's a cult classic. She was cast in The Mummy's Curse in 1944, where she plays this ancient Egyptian mummy who comes back to life and wreaks havoc on everybody. So, <laughs> But people that love that sci-fi monster horror genre, I mean, everybody knows her from that. Yes, yes. And then she also was in a film noir our favorite, The Killers. Yes. yes. And she's so good in this movie because she has this thankless role of playing Burt Lancaster's girlfriend, at least his girlfriend until he spots Ava Gardner. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but she's smart enough to know that she doesn't stand a chance against Ava Gardner. Right. So she very graciously bows out and marries this nice police guy played by Sam Levine and still stays friends with Burt. But it's a really lovely performance, I think, from her. And yeah. she also appeared in the remake of it because they remade that film in the, I think, the 1960s with Lee Marvin and Angie Dickinson. Oh, yes. And she gets to play in that version as well. Now, I, as we said, know her from the Folgers commercials. And so I was used to seeing her in that way. And then I saw Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Ah, yes. And I went, wait a minute, that's the lady from the Folgers commercials. God, that lovely, kind woman can be such a racist, horrible oh, person. Such a racist, horrible person. That scene, <laughs> it, it's, it's maybe, it's probably one of my top 10, if you were to pick like a single scene from a film when Catherine Hepburn walks her out to her car. Come along, Hillary. But darling, what you must be going through. She was trying not to worry about it. Now I have some instructions for you. Mm -hmm. I want you to go straight back to the gallery. Start your motor. When you get to the gallery, tell Jennifer that she will be looking after things temporarily. She's to give me a ring if there's anything she can't deal with herself. Then go into the office and make out a check for cash for the sum of $5,000. Then carefully... But carefully, Hillary, remove absolutely everything that might subsequently remind me that you had ever been there, including that yellow thing with the blue bulbs, which you have such an affection for. Then take the check for $5,000, which I feel you deserve, and get permanently lost. It's not that I don't want to know you, Hillary, although I don't. It's just that I'm afraid we're not really the sort of people that you can afford to be associated with. Don't speak, Hillary. Just go. It's just... It's genius. It's genius. It, and It truly is. And she was such a... <laughs> she was so awful. Awful, awful, awful. Well, but I think it, that was the beauty of Virginia Christine, because she could play lovely, and she could also play 
cold yes. and aloof and bitchy like nobody's business. And, and it's probably more fun to play, <laughs> to play the latter. <laughs> exactly. Right? She got a real boost in her career because she had a very small part in 1950 in the film The Men, which was Marlon Brando's film debut. Oh, And she really impressed the producer, the great Stanley Kramer. She became a favorite actress of his, and he placed her in almost all of his movies after that. She's in Cyrano de Bergerac, which Jose Ferrer won the best Oscar for. Yes, She's in High Noon with Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly, which was a Stanley Kramer production. Not as a Stranger, which had the most eclectic cast. It's Olivia de Havilland, Robert Mitchum. Frank Sinatra, Gloria Graham. I've never seen that. It's the strangest cast ever. But again, she gets to use her Swedish ancestry because she ended up coaching Olivia de Havilland, who has to do a Swedish accent. Ah. Yeah, I love that Stanley Kramer took care of her, always made sure she worked, always put her in movies. And of course, Stanley Kramer's the guy behind uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, yeah. I think it's time for our Hollywood pop quiz, Steve. Okay, for the pop quiz today, and we're going to keep with the theme of character actresses or female actors, and it's about the great Thelma Ritter, whom I loved. And and if we'd had more time, we would have certainly talked about her on this episode. She's a little bit more well-known. Our goal is to try to talk about people that maybe you don't know that you'll learn about. But Thelma Ritter, she started her career very late in life, and her film debut happens in a very popular and famous Christmas movie. What's the movie? Okay. We'll be back with the answer and more discussion about character actresses or or female female actors actors (laughs) after this. All right, Steve and Ed will be right back, but first, another stop on the Hollywood tour. Now, this one will blow your mind. We all know the word movie being the same as film, right? Well, originally, the term movies didn't refer to films, but rather to the people who were producing them. You see, it was widely used with great scorn by early Hollywood locals. Those people disliked all these invading Easterners, the people who were moving into Hollywood. Those people moving in were called the movies. And now back to Steve and Ann from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. Let's talk about the lovely Sarah Hayden. Sarah Hayden, again, one of my favorites, but I say that about all of them (laughs) because I love them all. (laughs) But Sarah Hayden has a special place in my heart because I grew up watching reruns of the Andy Hardy movies. I don't think anybody knows these movies anymore, but it was this wonderful series from MGM about the Hardy family headed by Louis Stone as Judge Hardy, his wonderful wife, Faye Holden, and there was Andy Hardy played by Mickey Rooney and the sister Marion Hardy played by Cecilia Parker. Parker, but then there was the matronly aunt Millie, played by Sarah, Sarah Hayden. Hayden, and she was Emily's sister. And she's usually in the kitchen. She doesn't have a lot to do, but every now and then, you know, she gets to step up into the forefront and have moments with Andy or with Marion and offer her sage advice as a woman of the world. And I just loved her. She was like this tall, lean, kind of stern-faced woman mm-hmm. who usually played baddies, but she's so good in the Andy Hardy movies. I just love. Well, we just talked about The Bishop's Wife a few episodes yes, back. Yes, yes. And she has a wonderful role in that as the officious secretary. Yes. And even in that, she's very stern and very proper. But, of course, Cary Grant is able to <laughs> warm her heart and she becomes more, she at least coquettish. smiles. Yes, she's, she's coquettish. coquettish. She is a bit coquettish. I, she so had a crush on Angel Cary Grant. Yes. But who wouldn't? Yes, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? <laughs> She's a Texas gal. I think she was born in Galveston. Her father was a doctor. Her mother was an actress, which was rare for Mm. that time. And she followed her mother's footsteps. She started in radio. She had this radio show for, you know, many years called, and I love the name of this, Moonshine and Honeysuckle. (laughs) (laughs) It was about small, you know, a small Southern town. We should have called our podcast that. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Again, she makes her screen debut on film at the age of 36. I love all of these actors that started later in life. It gives you hope. Don't give up, kids. As I've said, it gives me hope every time we talk about one of them. But her screen debut is in a movie called Spitfire, which was in 1934. It was based on a Broadway play that she had actually starred in. So they brought her to Hollywood to to, recreate the role for the film. Immediately, she was placed under contract at MGM, and she just brightened up the dullest of movies. I mean, if she was in it, you would find 
find something interesting about the film. But MGM used her in so many films, usually as, the, like you said, the officious secretary, the spinster, the stern teacher, the bad guy. And one of the worst, she's so horrible in Captain January, <laughs> where she plays Agatha uh, Morgan, who has just made life a living hell for little Shirley Temple. Oh, boy. Because <laughs> Shirley Temple is this little orphan girl. Her parents were killed at sea. She was rescued by this kindly sea captain played by Guy Kibbe. And she wants to take little orphan Shirley away from the captain. Uh, how bad is that? That's pretty bad. Yes. That's pretty bad. <laughs> then she would also appear in great movies like uh, The Shop Around the Corner. Right. She's one of the co-workers yes. who works with Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Sullivan in that great Christmas classic from 1940. I think one of her sweeter roles, and I love this, and it's hard to find, but she's in one of the Our Gang movies called Come Back Miss Phipps from 1941, and she plays the gang's beloved teacher, Mrs. Phipps, who unjustly gets fired. So the kids take it upon themselves to get Mrs. Phipps her job back, and comedy and craziness ensues. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great movie, and she's really, really wonderful in it. And you can see why the kids loved her so much. And she's also in Our Vines Have Tender Grapes in yeah. 19. 1945. I mean, blink and you'll miss her. I mean, she has such a tiny, tiny part as one of the townspeople friends, but you always gravitate towards her. She yes. just had one of those faces and, yes. and that presence about her that I think was wonderful. One of my favorite movies that she's in is a movie from 1934 called Undercover of Night. And it's really a strange part for her. <laughs> and it's kind of bizarre. And I can't believe I'm talking about it. But <laughs> She plays this professor, Janet Griswold, and she's about to discover this great discovery in physics because Sarah Hayden's a physicist. Okay, which I <laughs> just, can buy. I totally can take, buy that. Take the leap. But then she has this husband who's jealous of her scientific advances. Oh, well, what does he do? He basically causes her to have a heart attack by throwing her dog out the window. <laughs> no, he does I'm not. I'm sorry. I do should not that. laugh. I should not laugh at that. I should not well, laugh at so that. Well, it's so preposterous. It's horrible. But it's just a <laughs> shocking moment where where he literally just tosses a dog out the window. I mean, it's so surprising and shocking. And she had a really long, illustrious career. And one of her final films, and it was just the perfect cherry on top of her career, is she appears in the very last Andy Hardy movie, which they made many, many years after it started. Andy's grown up, has his own children. And it was just this wonderful, nostalgic, sentimental uh, wrap up of the series. And I love that, that that was one of her last things. Yeah. She passed away in 1981. Our next actress is one, I know, I say it too, one of my favorites, everybody's my favorite, but Mary Wicks. Oh my God, comic genius. Just a comic genius. You know, I was diving into her in preparation for today, and I found this quote that she said, which is just amazing. She was being interviewed, and she is quoted as saying, if you're a good character actress, a good comedian, you can play anything. If you're an ingenue, I might not work as often. <laughs> they have a harder nut to crack. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Which I love. Well, I because love she's, that. She's absolutely right. And she really lived that out. Oh, absolutely. I, I think if you're smart enough to identify yourself as a character actor, you will work for decades. Yes. I love her physicality. She had that lanky frame. She had that hawk-like nose. She had that froggy voice. She always played those no-nonsense housekeepers and nurses, nurses and secretaries yes. and busybodies. <laughs> yes. And I mean, the minute she was on screen, I could not take my eye off of her. Yeah, agreed. In any movie. Agreed. And I don't think she's ever better than she is in The Man Who Came to Dinner. Oh, my gosh. As Miss Preen, uh, the yes. nurse. <laughs> and learning that she originated that role on Broadway makes perfect sense with Monty Wolf. Of With course. Monty Woolley, absolutely. And their chemistry, that sort of antagonistic chemistry they have is perfection. Yeah. She really is able to straddle this line of being tough, but not in a mean way, yes. in just a... No nonsense. Like you said, yeah. you, you are not going to mess with her. Another good example of that, and she's also playing a nurse. She's in Now Voyager from 1942. She yes. plays Betty Davis's very difficult mother, played by Gladys George. She plays her nurse. Yes. And it inspires Betty Davis to say the famous line, Nora, I suspect you're a treasure. <laughs> 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 because and Nora has put sleeping pills in her tea or something. Yes. Like, Don't worry about your mom. I got this covered.
discovered. Yes, yes. <laughs> Basically. And really, that does sum up kind of Mary Wicks, that she was a treasure. And she yeah. handled her business. Yeah. She, she took care of things. <laughs> I personally love her as the nosy housekeeper in White Christmas. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's another one of those stock characters, but she makes it specific to that story. And she's really bringing everybody together in the end. Yeah. I mean, her nosiness really helps <laughs> yes. further on the plot. And, and helps. Does. Everyone reached their objectives. <laughs> right, right. It was a very, a very key role. I know. And who can forget her in The Music Man? She's Mrs. Squires in The Music Man. She's so wonderful. And just, again, that physicality is so hilarious as she sings her songs and does her thing. It's yeah. just genius. One of the ones I remember her from as a kid is The Trouble with Angels. Oh, of course. Yes. And seeing her as a nun. <laughs> and again, she, I think she was the, was she the physical education teacher? I think teacher? so. Sister Clarissa. Was okay. That it? Wow. Yeah. Good for you. Sister Clarissa. Pulled, pulled that out. <laughs> and again, she is playing a similar character, but she finds a way to make it her own. I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but she's a very comical looking woman. But if you want her funnier, put her in a nun's habit. And right. there you have it. <laughs> That's right. And just being able to play that dry, committed, serious. Oh, that deadpan, hilarious. Well, of course, she carried the nun theme deep into the 90s when she did the Sister Act movies, which yes. she's so hilarious as uh, Sister Mary Lazarus. Yeah, yeah Sister it? Mary Lazarus, oh, yeah. which is a very funny name. I know. Again, she was that no-nonsense, sort of crabby, let's get this done, no-nonsense woman. Right, right. And she was Meryl Streep's Ugh. grandmother in Postcards from the Edge. And she's so funny and so good in that movie. I had completely forgotten about yeah. that role. And uh, yeah, she's she's amazing. She is a very, was a very special woman. She passed away in 1995 after a very long career. One thing I, I will kind of add about her is she was also prolific on television and she was one of Lucille Ball's closest friends. And Lucille Ball placed her in almost every series she ever did. Yes. So if you look back at I Love Lucy, Here's Lucy, The Lucy Show, you will see Mary Wicks pop up as a guest star. She certainly made the transition to television very Absolutely. easily. Absolutely. And anybody of my generation, anyway, probably loved her on Saturday morning TV, Sigmund and the Sea Monster. <laughs> oh, I don't know that. Oh, she was great. So uh, that's one you have to check out. I, I th and it's yeah. literally little Johnny Whitaker finds these sea monsters for some reason. And I think she's the mother or the grandmother, and she's always the one who doesn't know they're sea monsters, and it's always this misunderstanding. But anyway. She's one of these actors in seeing her talk about her craft and about about what her career was, you can tell she loved what she did and yes. she just wanted to work. She was so great. Yeah. We cannot end this episode without talking about Louise Beavers, who was in over 150 movies. I mean, Louise Beavers left such a mark on film. And unlike the other ladies, I think she went into it with such a disadvantage because there just weren't roles written for African-American women or men, of course, that were anything beyond a maid or a cook or a nurse. And so she was very limited with the roles that she was able to take. Right. But that Hollywood was that allowing Hollywood was, would her. allow her to. But yeah. what she did with these roles was remarkable. I it mean, really she, was. The roles might have been stereotypical, but she never leaned into that. She brought such warmth and such humanity and such humor to these roles that it's made her one of my favorite character actresses. I think most people know her best from, again, it's a Christmas favorite, Holiday Inn, mm -hmm. where she played. Bing Crosby's housekeeper at the inn. And what always strikes me is that her character Mamie is probably the smartest character in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. Because if it weren't for Mamie, Bing Crosby would never have gotten the gumption to go to Hollywood and steal back Marjorie Reynolds from that conniving Fred Astaire. And you're right. If Mamie had not set him straight. That is and right. And I, I love that. And that's the type of character she was known for. Another good example, she plays Gussie, the housekeeper in Miss Mr. Blandings builds his dream house from yes. 1948. And she basically saves the day again because she gives Cary Grant the winning advertising slogan for Wham Ham. <laughs> <laughs> 
if you're not eating wham, you're not eating ham. Ham. (laughs) Again, she's the smart one. She's the one who saves the day. But it's just so unfortunate there weren't roles beyond that scope for her. Because I think had there been, or had she been alive today, she would be taking on roles that Viola Davis and Octavia Spencer play. Absolutely. You know, very complicated women that, that are more than just the help. Right. More than a stereotype. She did have an opportunity in a 1934 film called Imitation of Life, Yes, which, as you say in the blog, should have earned her an Oscar nomination. She's so wonderful in that film. It's just heartbreaking. There are problems with that film as yes. we look at it. So in many problems. Today's lens. But her performance as Delilah is, as you said, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Just the dignity that she brings to that character, despite her circumstances, is amazing. But basically, what works so much about that character in that role is that she's just playing a mother. Yes. It doesn't matter if she's black or white or, or whatever. She's just playing a mother who sacrifices and loves her daughter. Exactly. Yeah. And if only Hollywood in that time period could have seen that for all actors of color. And we just hope that they continue to take away any boundaries that are there. Yes, absolutely. Louise Beaver, she was born March 8th, 1900 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, her family moved to Pasadena when she was a child. And she, it's, this is, I find this interesting. She started her career as a member of the Lady Minstrels, which was a group of these young women who staged amateur productions and appeared on stage at the Lowe's State Theater. Yeah. And an agent for black performers saw her performing as a Lady Minstrel and uh, offered her the opportunity to audition for a, a film. And she made her screen debut in a very small role in the very famous version of Uncle Tom's Cabin from 1927. Mm. Again, a movie with problems and stereotypical characters, Characters. but I think important in the historical sense of the film history. Right. And then after that, her career just took off. She appears in dozens and dozens and dozens of movies. You know, usually The Maid. She's Constance Bennett's Maid in What Price Hollywood in 1931. She's the hilarious maid of Mae West in She Done Him Wrong in 1933. She's B.B. Daniels' maid in 42nd Street in 1933. So she got the maid thing down. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But she got a really rare chance to play something other than the maid. And I've never seen this movie, and it's very hard to find. I would love to see it. But it's a movie called Reform School in 1939. And she plays this character named Mother Barton, who's this free-thinking probation officer who wants to bring an honor system to reform schools. And it's a movie about... uh, issue. It's, you know, something pretty dramatic. She's and not she, playing a stereotypical And she's not. She's playing a character. woman who's actually out there doing something and, and yeah. you know, causing change and, and, and good for a system, which I would love to see it. I'm, I'm still searching for a copy of it. So if I find it, I will report back. Yeah. And come on, TCM, yeah. find it for us. I know. Find it for us. I'm surprised <laughs> they, they haven't found it yeah. and, and shown it. What I find really interesting about Louise Beavers is as she became more well-known, she began to be criticized for the roles that she accepted. People were alleging that these roles were um, showing blacks in a subservient bad light. And she really thought about this. And I think it was it was tough for her to take some of these roles, but she dismissed the criticism. She acknowledged that she had limited opportunities as an actress. And, right. she, and she said, and this is a quote from her that, that I really think is interesting. I am only playing the parts. I don't live them. She actually got very involved with the civil rights movement, Mm -hmm. really trying to support other African-American artists. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think she recognized the limitations and she did with it what she could. And she, you know, made a career out of it. So you can't knock her for that. And she died way too young. (laughs) Way too young. In 1962. Yeah. But great actress, always brought something special to every movie she was in. She absolutely did. I think we could talk about so many more. Oh, so many more. Agnes Moorhead, Mary Boland. <sighs> we got to do a whole episode Edna on Agnes Oliver. Moorhead. I could yes. go on and on. Yes. Charlotte you know. Greenwood. <laughs> Charlotte Greenwood. Mildred Natwick. <laughs> well, you know, actually, if you go back to the original blog, we talk about 15 actresses. So there's a lot of actresses we didn't get to that you can read about in the blog, which you can find at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. And we'd love it if you would follow us on social media. Our handle is at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign. Gee, what a surprise, right? (laughs) And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube, where you'll also see some photographs of the people that we've been talking about. Before we go, let's give the answer to this week's Hollywood Pop Quiz. 
Yes. And the question was, in what holiday film does the great Thelma Ritter make her screen debut? And she was, I think, in her 30s at this point. I don't know. Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> you of all people, Nan. She made her screen debut in The Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, that was her debut. As she played the mother of the little boy in line to see Santa Claus. And she's hilarious. She is hilarious. She's the one who gets the ball rolling on the whole idea of suggesting that they go to other, other stores, stores. To buy and toys. she's like, and she loves it. <laughs> yeah, she takes that yes. ball and runs that, with it. That was her screen debut. So that's it for us today. But if you have any questions, you have any comments, you have any uh, ideas for a podcast you'd love to hear in the future, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Cubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com The executive producers are Steve Cubine and Ann McNamara. Executive producer and post-production supervisor, Lindsay Schneebly. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit AirwaveMedia.com to listen Listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schneebly and Toth. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. That's a wrap.